This is the video for chapter 9, lessons 1 and 2. And what we're looking at is significance tests. So significance tests are really similar to confidence intervals that we just covered. However, significance test, it's kind of like looking at the opposite of a confidence interval. We developed a confidence interval, and then we decided if something was plausible <clears throat> based on whether the value was within our interval. A significance test uh, looks at a sample, sample statistic and decides whether it's plausible or not by determining whether it's outside the confidence interval. So they're kind of like complements to each other. So uh, the first here is just the basics, but I want to give you an idea of what I mean by that. So here's a problem we'd look at with a significance test. So here's a mayoral election. Uh, the mayor needs at least 50% of the vote. So uh, they want to get an idea if they have confidence that they're going to win. So they found an SRS, and 56 out of the 100 people in the SRS um, said they'll vote for Simone. So now she felt like she's confident she's going to win. So there's two possible explanations for this sample statistic. Uh, the first one is that 50% at most support Simone and the favorable sample proportion was doing due to sampling variability so it, just by chance uh, she actually doesn't have half of the half or more of the candidates supporting her however she by chance got an SRS of 100 that was 56 percent so there's our null hypothesis now she would like to be able to reject that and say that this 56 out of 100 couldn't happen by chance um, that it's far enough away from 50% to show that she should win. So the alternative is that she has more than 0.5, 50% uh, of the support. If she can prove that the 56 out of 100 shows that this isn't true, then she can reject this null hypothesis and assume that she is going to win the election. So let's see what the numbers look like. So here's a simulation of 400 samples of size 100 in which exactly 50% of the population supports Simone. So here's the true parameter. You can notice it's approximately normal, centered around the true mean. Now 56% are sampling percentages up here in the curve. So this area is what we'd be looking at. Now you can see that even when 50% is the true value, we still, are, by chance, we have all of these, all of these SRSs that gave us 56% or more. We also have values far down here, close to 30%, which looks like about 32%. So just by chance, we end up with values that are pretty far away from the true parameter. So we're going to determine whether <clears throat> this is plausible based on a 1 in 20 or 5% chance, meaning that if the area at 56% and to the right is less than 5% of the normal curve, meaning it could happen less than 5% of the time, then it's not plausible. So then we could reject the fact that, uh, that this would be centered around 0.5. Reject the fact that she only has 50% or less of the vote. So that's the idea here. We want to see if by chance a certain sample statistic could occur, or if that sample statistic shows that the, the, the hypothesized parameter, what, we, what people propose this hypothesized parameter of 50%, if 56% is far enough away from 50% to show that, in fact, the true parameter is not 50%. So in this case, uh, with our simulation now, it looks like 13.75% of the 400 samples have p hat at 0.56 or bigger. So the probability of getting a sample statistic, a sample proportion of 0.56 or larger, is about 14%, a little under given that the true parameter is 0.5. So just due to the sampling variability, um, we could get a value that's 6% off a good amount of the time, about 14% of the time. Now this is one simulation, so we're going to look at what this number should be using a significance test. So give yourself a little check here. This isn't going to be the multiple choice, this is just going to be a checkpoint. So pause this and see if you can answer this question. So based on this result, is it plausible that she doesn't have more than 50% of the vote, that she has 50% or less, based on this probability of 0.1375? So compare it to 0.05 or 5%. Now pause and try to answer yourself. 
Well, since 13.75% is more than 5%, meaning it could happen more than 5% of the time, we're going to say it's plausible. That means we're going to fail to reject, um, fail to reject the null hypothesis since a 14% chance of occurring is larger than 5%. So it would be answer D here. So our test is addressing a specific claim. And if we have a p-value, a probability that the statistic is that value or more extreme, meaning greater than, or if we're on the other side of the normal curve, less than, uh, is less than 5% of the time, meaning the area of the normal cur curve is less than 5%, we can reject the claim and assume the alternative hypothesis. So for each test, <clears throat> there should be two possible explanations. The first is that the value is correct and the sample statistic is, differs because of chance which is what we just saw before, is that we could, there could be 50% of the vote, and by chance that SRS could have been 0.56 just due to sampling variability. The second explanation is that the sample statistic differs far enough, like it's big enough of a difference, so that we can say that the, the hypothesized parameter is not in fact true. So if instead of 56%, we got an SRS that was like 62%, That'd be far enough away from 50% to, for us to be sure that she has at least 50% of the vote. We could reject the claim that she has 50% or less then. So you're going to always state the null hypothesis, with the, which is generally we're going to use with an equal sign, generally. Um, so the, in this case, in the last problem, it could have been the null hypothesis would be that the parameter is 0.5. Uh, and then an alternative hypothesis, which she thought that she had more than 50% of the vote, so it would be greater than um, point, greater than 0.5. Now, they should express hopes or suspicions we have before we see the data instead of just fitting the hypothesis to the data. So these should be established before you go through the test and look at the data. So we can either do a one-sided or two-sided test. A one-sided test uh, would look at the probability that our alternative hypothesis would be that it's greater than or less than. So in, in the case we just looked at, it was a one-sided test because we were only concerned with the right side of the normal curve. The probability that, um, that a sampling stati sample statistic was 0.56 or greater. Uh, however, we could do a two-sided test, which would be a not equal sign, meaning it could be less than or could be greater than. We're going to do more of the one-sided test, but we'll also be going over two-sided tests. So the p-value is what we got, what we estimated with the simulation in that problem we looked at uh, was 13.75. So the p-value is the area of the normal curve that's at the sample statistic or more extreme than it. So what I mean by more extreme is 13.75, um, I'm sorry, 0.56 or greater in the case we looked at, since our alternative hypothesis was that the true parameter is um, greater than 0.5. Now, we say more extreme because we could also, our al alternative hypothesis could have a less than sign. So um, the alternative hypothesis could be that the true value is less than 0.5. So the smaller the p-value, meaning the less plausible something is. So a p-value of 1% would be strong evidence against the null hypothesis, meaning that we could only get that sample statistic 1% of the time if the, if the hypothesized parameter is correct. <clears throat> so think of this as like a criminal trial, innocent until proven guilty. So we can either reject our null hypothesis because our p-value is small enough, meaning it's not probable to get that sample statistic given the proposed parameter, or we can fail to reject it, meaning we don't have evidence that it's not true, but it, it still could be untrue. For example, 0.56 is pretty far from 0.5, so she had 56% of that SRS. She could be winning, we just don't have evidence that she's not winning, so that's what we were looking there for there. We have, um, we don't have enough evidence to say that 0.56 that she's for sure, based on that SRS, that she's for sure going to win the election. Uh, if the number was bigger, like I said before, 62%, then our evidence would be stronger. Because if the true value is 50%, we're not going to get 62% in the sample statistic very often because it's so far from the true, um, the true mean. Smaller p-values, greater evidence. Larger p-values fail to give, to give convincing evidence. So because they fail to give it, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. We never say accept the null hypothesis. Just like you say guilty or not guilty. Nobody's ever proven innocent in the court of law. 
So pause this to read about statistically significant. So a small p-value, we reject the null hypothesis, we conclude the alternative. A large p-value, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we can't conclude the alternative in context of the problem. We use this symbol to represent the p-value. We use 0.05 the most often, but just like we did 90, 95%, and 99% confidence intervals, uh, the significance test is like the complement to that, so we'll use 1%, 5%, and 10%. So, but generally, we we'll use 5% the most. Read about choosing the significance level here. Here's a short explanation of type 1 and type 2 errors. So take a look at this on your, uh, read over this, pause right now and read over it. And a little chart to help you with that. Uh, if we reject H0 and it was actually true, we made a type 1 error. If we fail to reject H0 and it's actually false, we made a type 2 error. Um, so rejecting something when it's true is always worse than failing to reject it when it's actually false. Um, so we're going to be going over this, these ideas more in class. So keep in mind significance tests and confidence intervals are like complements. Significance tests um, check to see whether a value is outside the confidence interval basically. So they check to see what percent of the values and um, would be at the sample statistic or more extreme. Whereas a confidence interval gives you a range of values that we're confident the true parameter lies within. So we're going to do state plan do conclude for these problems and check the conditions just the same way. For proportions, here's our z-score, the statistic minus the parameter over the standard deviation. Uh, for proportions, that would look like this. Our sample statistic, sample proportion minus the parameter over the standard deviation of the statistic. Now the result of a significance test is either rejecting the null hypothesis and assuming the alternative, or uh, failing to reject. So we get more information from a confidence interval because it gives us a range of values we can be confident the true value, true parameter lies within. Um, confidence intervals really line up with two-sided tests because confidence interval would be the middle part. The two-sided test is checking to see whether the value doesn't fall either less than the confidence interval or greater than the confidence interval. So just keep in mind that what we're looking at now, the probabilities, are like the areas that are outside the confidence interval. So here's how we carry out the significance test for that problem that we looked at about Simone running for office. Um, we'd assume that 50% of the voters support, and we took an SRS of 100 people. We're going to use 0 .05, so we give the information that we, uh, our sample proportion, we give our significance level, 0 .05, and then we do our hypotheses. So our null hypothesis is that she has 50% of the vote, could be less. Uh, we could do another significance test to see if it's less than, but she's suspecting that she has more than 50% of the vote, so she wants to be able to reject this claim. The alternative hypothesis is that she's going to win. She has more than 50% of the vote. So that's how we represent our null hypothesis. This is how we represent our alternative hypothesis. For the plan, we check our three conditions. We have an SRS. There's our, we're checking the condition for prop sample proportions for normality and our independent condition. Go back in chapter 7 and 8 if you're having trouble with those conditions still, but they're just the same as we've gone over. So and in this uh, SRS, we had 0.56 as our sample proportion. So in the do section of the problem, here's what we'd go through and calculate. Calculate our test statistic, or our z-score. So that's p hat minus p over the standard deviation of the statistic. So go ahead and calculate that. Now, your multiple choice is right here. You're going to finish this problem off. I'm going to have you use your calculator for this. So you go to stat test, one prop z test. So our p naught here means what is the proposed parameter from the null hypothesis? That's equals 0.5. X would be the numerator in our sample statistic, while n's our sample size of the, the the denominator in our sample statistic. So if you missed those, go back in the video to see what they were. But remember, SRS was 56 out of 100. So 56 out of 100 said they supported Simone. Uh, select greater than p naught since our alternative hypothesis is that the true proportion is greater than 0.5. Click draw in order to see a picture of the probability and it shows you the z-score. If you get an error, try deleting uh, what you have in your y equals um, screen or, and turning off your stat plots and then trying again. Now I want you to draw it. You click draw because it'll show you a picture of what we're talking about. It'll show you where 0.56 is and, the, and shade the area that's greater than it. So that area that's shaded represents the p-value. So now your multiple choice is to compare that to a significance level of 0.05 to see if that value um, is greater than is or less than 5% and answer this question as a result. So pause now and compare that on using your calculator.